So I hope everyone can see the screen. So let's start uh, with case number one. Uh, I hope the panel has their notes out, their notepads. So um, case number one, 32 year old Asian woman is referred to see you for hepatitis. She's previously healthy. She is actually a UCLA medical resident. And she reports that she has donated blood regularly to the UCLA blood drive each year. There's no family history of liver disease and she was born in the United States. Eight weeks ago, she sustained a needle stick injury while suturing a patient. She went to occupational health, and there she had blood test checks, and they are listed here. ALT 17, hepatitis B core negative, hepatitis B surface antibody 15, anti-HCV negative, HIV negative. So she was cleared by occupational health and told she needs no further follow-up. And then two weeks ago, she developed a very nonspecific epigastric discomfort with nausea, a little bit of malaise. Uh, she said that one time while sleeping, she awoke with a very sharp pain, stabbing in severity. No emesis, no fever. It kind of slowly resolved. But she went to see her PCP the following day. Repeat blood tests were obtained. Now she has a transaminitis. Anti-HAV positive. Hepatitis B surface antigen negative. Surface antibody positive pregnancy test negative, anti-HCV positive. An abdominal ultrasound was normal. No evidence of biliary obstruction. So now she's referred to my distinguished panelists for their opinion. At this point, I just wanted to ask anyone actually, um, feel free to chime in. What are your thoughts and what would you like to do? So, so Steve, th th this is a very interesting case uh, with the lady who, who has no uh, a history of underlying viral hepatitis and, and with the normal liver test, really no, con no idea of uh, underlying liver disease, gets a needle stick. Um, and then I, I, we, I note that her liver tests are high and so is her hepatitis C antibody. Um, so I don't know how my, my colleagues feel, but this, this is suspicious for uh, an acute hepatitis C uh, episode. Uh, and uh, and I, don't, I don't know how my, my colleagues feel about that diagnosis. I mean, I don't think it's autoimmune. I don't think it's drug induced liver disease. Because the liver tests were normal before, I don't think she has underlying autoimmune hepatitis, although she is in the right age group. Uh, and I probably would check for autoimmune tests just in case. Mm -hmm. um, the, the normal ultrasound and the lack of symptoms suggest, you know, no, no gallstones uh, as, a, as a cause for elevated liver test. I, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Saab, and I will confirm the diagnosis with uh, more blood work, including uh, RNA testing for hepatitis C. Yeah. Okay. And, and I guess the million dollar question is, if this is acute hepatitis C, confirmed with the viral, like, like Akabani said, uh, what do you do? Do you, do you, Steve? Do you do you let her do, do wait wait another you know several months and see if she closes the virus on her own, or do you start therapy now? Um, that's a million dollar question. So let's move ahead and um, see what was done. Well, we did do additional testing. Mm. CBC, relatively normal, INR, normal. I wanted to confirm, you know, that she did not have acute hepatitis A, so we checked an AIGM that was negative. Mm. Autoimmune markers, negative. Again, we just checked the anti-HCV because you can have false positives, but it came back positive again. And as Dr. El Kabani said, we confirmed that she was HCV RNA positive genotype 1B. Um, so as Dr. Saab asked, 
Who would treat her? Who would treat her? Who would watch her? So, so historically, when we had interferon, we all gave patients uh, three to four months to see if they clear on their own because, um, because 15 to 20 percent of patients clear the virus on their own. Uh, and we always felt that with interferon, it would be much easier to treat when someone has acute uh, compared to when, when someone has got established liver disease. With the direct acting agents being safe, effective, and tolerable, and the new uh, concept of hepatitis C not just being a medical problem, but a public health issue, uh, and, and with the goal of preventing transmission, um, I don't know how Dr. Yanni and Akabani feel about treating it right now versus waiting for to see she clears on her, on her own. Uh, well, with the uh, safety and easy oral one pill a day or two pills a day, uh, I would treat her, right? Uh, if, if she's, I mean, if it is confirmed, which is confirmed, so I will treat this lady. Hmm? Yeah, I, I, I would completely agree. It's very interesting that, that she developed antibodies within, within, uh, within two weeks. I think she uh, she's she's probably one of the lucky ones to develop antibodies so quick, uh, so that way the the uh, phys her physicians would know about it. Um, and I, I completely agree with uh, Dr. Okabani. Uh, the the treatment is available; it's safe um, and uh, so f and efficacious. Um, and she's otherwise a young, healthy woman. Um, I I would err on the side of treating her. You think that the insurance pushed back from treating acute hepatitis C because of drugs? Uh, Steve, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this, drugs are approved for chronic hepatitis C. Would it be pushed back from insurance company to treat acute hepatitis C or they don't really care about that? I don't think, um, I haven't had much pushback, although I haven't treated many acutes. No. But, um, but uh, the, you know, like you said, the, there is a spontaneous clearance rate. It's, it's not great. It, it is. It does happen, though, but I think by far, I think most people who get acute hepatitis C will go on to develop chronic. Steve, can I ask, a, can I ask my colleagues a question about, about other things besides treatment? I mean, Mohammed, Bishar, what else we do bef with, with, uh, in addition to treating acute hepatitis C? I mean, family, family stuff, you know, sharing toothbrushes. Well, so anything else we should worry about? Alcohol, smoking, you know. Anything else we need to warn her about besides treating the hepatitis C? Well, of course, she should be counseled about any hepatotoxic medications, uh, including, of course, uh, alcohol. Mm -hmm. And uh, she should be counseled as well about the risk factors of hepatitis C uh, mm -hmm. transmission. Uh, sharing razors, uh, it's very rarely to share uh, toothbrushes and uh, uh, try to avoid touching open wounds for someone else. Yeah. Well, I think in the interest of time, we should keep going because uh, I have a couple of slides to kind of summarize this case, although Dr. Saab actually touched upon most of the important points. So you can see here, these are the AASLD Infectious Disease Society recommendations for the management of acute hepatitis C. What is recommended? We should be checking antibody and HCV RNA if you suspect anyone acute hepatitis C. Now, if you recall, that was the error with the um, Occupational Health Office. They only checked anti-HCV. Um, which was negative. So the recommendation, if you suspect acute hepatitis C, is to check antibody and HCV RNA. There's no recommendation for pre-exposure or even post-exposure prophylaxis. Why do you have to check both? Anti-HCV, as Dr. Yanni said, takes a while to develop. It can be delayed and might not show up for as long as six weeks after exposure. So if you only check antibody, you will miss acute hepatitis C. You have to check HCV RNA, which for the most part will become detectable very, very early on. ALT, you recall at the occupational health, they checked the ALT, which was normal. But ALT is very inaccurate. We should not be checking ALT 
uh, to rule out acute hepatitis C. So just to, to kind of bring you up to date, here's the algorithm. If you have a suspected exposure within 48 hours or two days, you check the antibody and you check the uh, PCR, HCV RNA. If both are negative, no infection. If the antibody is positive, but the RNA is negative, this is an indication of prior exposure. In both cases, they do not have hepatitis C. You can continue to monitor them for the next six months. If nothing becomes positive, they're finished. However, if the patient does develop positive HCV RNA, then they will be diagnosed with acute infection. Now, in the first 48 hours, if you check and the antibody is negative, but HCV RNA is positive, that is acute hepatitis C. Or if the patient has antibody positive and HCV RNA positive, that's chronic infection. In both cases, the recommendations are to treat and to treat right away. And then I'll go into some of the other things uh, that we need to do. So AASLD IDSA recommendation, regimens for acute hepatitis C, because the current regimens are all highly efficacious and safe, the same regimens that are recommended for chronic hepatitis C are recommended for acute hepatitis C. No change in the regimen. Treat exactly as you would with a chronic. Recommendations for medical management after the initial diagnosis with viremia, defined as quantifiable RNA, HCV treatment should be initiated without awaiting spontaneous resolution no delay. And then, as was discussed, counseling is recommended during acute hepatitis C infection to avoid hepatotoxics, to avoid alcohol consumption, and uh, measures to reduce the risk of HCV transmission to others. And if appropriate, referral to an addiction medicine specialist, especially if this is a patient who acquired it from, say, injection drug use. All right, we have about oh, 12, about uh, eight to nine minutes. So let's go over case number two. Notepads ready. Um, 35 year old Caucasian gentleman referred to you for yellow eyes. Previously healthy patient with no past medical history. He is a graduate student in college. He also reports donating blood regularly at his university blood drive. No family history of liver disease, and he was born in the United States. Over spring break, he attended a college reunion in Las Vegas with some friends, and he admitted that he may have partied a bit too much. Upon returning to school, he was tired, but otherwise felt fine. And then about two months later, beginning of June, he noticed increasing fatigue, myalgias, darkening urine color, and then a few days later, yellowing of his eyes. He presented to the College Student Health Center. Blood tests were obtained. Mark transaminitis, hyperbilirubinemia, INR 1.2, Hepatitis A antibody total positive, oops. Hepatitis B core positive. Hepatitis B surface antigen positive. Anti-HCV negative. Abdominal ultrasound showed a little bit of fatty liver, mildly enlarged liver, but otherwise no other biliary abnormalities. And now he comes to see you. What would you like to do with this patient? And what do you think he has? Wow, this is a, t a very tough case and a, a very scary, Steve. Yeah. I mean, liver tests over a thousand. Um, this guy is deeply jaundiced. He's probably fluorescent in your office. 
Um, so th the only thing I could see uh, on the blood test from the, it's a hepatitis B surge antigen positive. So like, like Muhammad said, the previous apparently needs to be confirmed, but this patient makes me very nervous. Uh, I'm glad his ultrasound does not show cirrhosis, no cirrhosis, and I show, I'm glad it shows uh, no ascites, but I'd be worried about this patient. Any other comments? Yeah, uh, definitely same here. Um, the, sir, the hepatitis B surface antigen positivity uh, is definitely concerning. Um, and the uh, tra elevated transaminase is over a thousand um, uh, with a very high bilirubin and, and uh, the INR is not completely normal as well. Uh, would make me very concerned that this patient may have an acute viral hepatitis, um, uh, namely hepatitis B, um, that may uh, and may go into uh, liver liver failure. But it would do so, some more um, confirmation testing, uh, get the get the PCR and uh, at least get the core IgM. As I know, this core there is core total, but uh, it could mean that the patient may have been exposed uh, previously, uh, but at least get the core IgM to see whether this is, to help determine if this is acute hepatitis B. Uh, I will add the getting new uh, set of blood work mm -hmm. to put in our differential diagnosis uh, daily. Uh, any uh, hepatotoxic medications, any herbs, any uh, energy drinks, which sometimes cause uh, uh, abnormal liver tests and uh, cholestasis as well. Yeah, I, I, Steve, I would feel more comfortable with this patient being treated at, at a large transplant center like with you. Um, because I, you know, I, I just don't know where the patient's gonna end up with the BLV 8.5, it's very concerning. So uh, just to remind everyone, he um, had uh, also donated blood oh. prior to all of this and it was always accepted. So you know that he, had no viral hepatitis before. So this is definitely looking acute. So uh, I think it was as Mohammed or Bashoy had mentioned, you know, we, we just need a little more granularity, right? Uh, so we should check some other blood tests just to really clarify. Uh, so A, IgM was negative. So that positive A total was, you know, probably prior hep A exposure or vaccination, whatever but that's not the cause of this. Core IgM was positive. So this is looking like acute surface antigen positive. Of course, uh, surface antibody is negative. Viral load, 1 million. HCV RNA not detected. Always check Delta. That's my big thing. Negative. Of course, E, negative. So it is looking a lot like acute hepatitis B. The patient remains somewhat fatigued, but is otherwise clinically stable. Um, what would you, I mean, so remember, you're seeing him in clinic now. Um, you know, he's, he's still an outpatient. So it, it, what would you do at this point? Would you initiate antiviral therapy? So you know, I, you know, if if he doesn't have signs of liver failure, uh, um, you know, ascites, maybe some mental status changes, uh, uh, you know, prolonged INR, uh, kidney function deterioration, uh, you know, one option is to watch him. Um, but I got to tell you, Steve, I'd, I'd be very nervous, and I'll probably get blood tests pretty often, maybe even every few days. If yeah. I don't start therapy. But, but this guy makes me nervous. And I guess, Steve, I think this is the kind of patient that, that I would refer someone like you um, and follow it at, at a transplant center. I, I completely agree that at the least, this, this patient requires monitoring if you choose not to, to treat the patient. Who would, who would put them on entecovir, tenofovir? Who would start antiviral therapy now? Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I, I agree with Dr. Saab. Um, I think we this requires very careful monitoring, uh, but it's a very challenging case because the liver numbers are really high, and and you wouldn't know when a patient uh, when the patient might get into liver failure. So it's always a, a question mark in our 
in the back of our minds, would you monitor this patient as inpatient? And if so, how long? That's what makes this uh, case very challenging. But short of having uh, acute liver failure with mental status changes, um, I would uh, continue to closely monitor and not put on antiviral therapy. Anybody else want to add an opinion? Dr. Hahn, can I, uh, uh, Trisha, email us a question um, for, for you, and it is, uh, would you would you consider checking CMV or HSV or EBV in, in people this 60? Um, you know, that that's very reasonable, and I, I wouldn't say, you know, I would say that's very reasonable to do. Um, you know, this patient obviously has acute hepatitis B, of course, no reason why he shouldn't have the others. Um, so I, I think it would be reasonable, especially if, you, if the patient's getting worse and, and getting sicker, um, for sure. Steve, can I make one last comment? You know, what's interesting yeah. is, you know, it's, it's one thing to remember is, you know, we've been immunizing people in this country and most of the world for the past 25 years. Yeah. But as you brought up, Steve, this gentleman is 35. So he's probably, too, he's probably born after the immunization in the United States. So this guy is naive and I see people like this, all, I mean, not all the time, but quite often. Um, yeah, too old for the vaccines. I didn't. I, I didn't go into details. But he may have even been an international student, and so. Anyways, I think I'll just kind of wrap it up. Just to remind everyone, of course, these are the basic serologies. Um, surface antigen goes up and comes down quickly following an acute infection and then anti-HBS develops. This is the window between surface antigen loss and surface antigen development where you can miss acute hepatitis A if you're only check or acute hepatitis B if you're only checking surface antigen. So that's why the core IgM is the serologic marker for acute hepatitis B. And then as the, the, is, is, is the um, infection goes on, the patient will develop uh, IgG core and uh, E antigen, E antibody, hepatitis B remains positive. But just to wrap up, um, acute hepatitis B per the CDC and WHO, there is no specific treatment for acute hepatitis B. We have antiviral therapy, but it's not specific treatment for acute hepatitis B. Remember, the vast majority of adults who get acute hepatitis B will recover spontaneously. And actually, the fact that he's jaundiced with high transaminases, those are all signs of a good immune response against the virus. So it's a very high likelihood that he will probably spontaneously recover. But you know what? You never know, like Dr. Saab and everyone said. Uh, you have to watch them closely because you don't know exactly which way they're going to go. The reason is antiviral therapy would really only be indicated in the case of fulminant liver failure. So if this patient, the lab should get worse, he should develop encephalopathy, and you are concerned about fulminant liver failure, he should be transferred to a liver transplant center. And in this case, I think all of us would agree that we would start antiviral therapy. But the key is vaccination. Like Dr. Saab said, vaccination is very important. And, uh, and uh, with good vaccination, we should all be protected. So that's my section. Um, thank you very much, panel. Um, and I guess we'll move on to the next speaker.